Hi, I'm Ken Saltman. We're at UIC with undergraduate, master's, and doctoral students here meeting with uh, Professor Henry Giroux. Uh, uh, we're here to talk about his newest book, Pedagogy of Resistance. It's an exciting uh, new book. I think it may be his 70, it's hard to keep track, Henry. Uh, it's between well, 70 and 80, I think, maybe. Um, but but it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. And um, we're excited. Students have uh, have read your. Uh, we started two different courses, reading some of your early work uh, from theory and resistance in education. They've watched some of your videos and they've read uh, your your newest book, and they're excited to uh, chat with you about it. So, great, great. thanks, Henry. Uh, should we hear from Ella? Sure. Hi, I'm Ella. Nice to finally meet you. Oh my goodness. Um, I, my question, I suppose, kind of relates to that comment. Um, in chapter four of your new book, you talk about how we can't, you quote Michael Yates, who says that we can't settle for incremental changes. You know, we have to have a general idea of the world we want to inhabit, and we need to go know how to go about bringing such a place to existence. Um, and I definitely thought that was very true, but I also thought it requires a level of unity that's difficult to achieve only because I feel like um, in an age of immediate and widely accessible internet sharing, our society's kind of lost the ability to forge a common truth. Um, and I know you talked about education as kind of an antidote to that. And I guess the question I had for you would be how we can educate perhaps an unwilling audience on social truths that are so often perceived as radical theory, especially in an age of you know, um, the legislation in Florida and Texas that seems so combative to any sort of progressive forms of education. And even in those areas, I just wondered if you had any ideas on um, educating those kinds of audiences. Uh, Ella, I, I think there, there are two questions there that, that, I, that are very interesting. And I mean, the first question is, how do you create a politics of what I call the totality? You know that's comprehensive, that's able to bring together different different forms of resistance in ways to suggest that there's a thread that should unite them as opposed to separating them, while at the same time affirming uh, those particular differences that are being addressed in particular groups. That's a really important issue, and it, it seems to me that you need a a, lang a larger language that unites those. And for me, it's the language of radical democracy. You know how you can't have a democracy if you have racism and you and you don't believe in sexism. I mean, you it doesn't work that way. You know, all of these elements speak to uh, all of these differences tend to speak to moments of social justice. That that even one, if one is missing, that democracy is in peril. Whether we're talking about ecological devastation, we're talking about sexism, racism, we're talking about the massive degrees of inequality. The key is to bring them together. Secondly, it, it seems to me that there, there are two issues that are important when talking to audiences that might be at odds with what, you know, what one believes in politically and what one is trying to say. And I think the first issue is that people often operate around languages that embody what I would, you know, Ken has probably talked about this, would embody common sense assumptions that basically go unchallenged. You know, A, capitalism and democracy are the same thing. Well, I don't think so. I don't think they're the same thing. When money drives politics and four people own 50% of all the wealth in the country, that's not a democracy. Um, and, and secondly, you know, how do we give them a language that allows them uh, or provide a language or talk about a language that allows them to build up, that they can recognize in terms of the issues that they inhabit and then build upon those issues. I mean, i.e., for instance, you get a guy like DeSantis talking about how, you know, you know, Disney uh, is a corporation that basically hates parents, you know, uh, in defense of an anti-gay law, no less. And I, and, I, and I think the real question here to begin to say is like, what, what do you want schools to do? I mean, do you really want schools to teach kids to be stupid? Do you want kids, schools that regi are so regimented that they can't basically understand history and end up being educated to be ignorant. I mean, you have to appeal to needs that they recognize that are in their lives, but don't have a language to put them in a wider, broader sense of understanding 
that would expand their own politics and empower their own sense of agency. How, how do you speak to people in a language they recognize? How do you talk about problems they understand? And how do you take use that language to amplify those problems in a way they haven't understood before? That's, that's I mean, it seems to me, that's, that's how you do it. You know, you, uh, you, you've got to be empathetic. You, you've got to listen. And, and you've, got to, you've got to play with the language. You know, you, you've got to open it up. These languages are often closed that I, I find that right-wing authoritarians inhabit. Very closed languages, you know. Uh, you know, the public sphere is only for white people. Uh, the politics of exclusion is okay. The market should dominate all of everyday life. I mean, these things have to be challenged. And we have to challenge them not only by talking about wh how, where they've come from and whose interests they serve, but what it means to shut down their own sense of agency. Right, because politics is basically a struggle over agency, matters of agency, matter of governance, matter matters of ethics. Miss May, do you want to jump in here? Yeah. Um, well, uh, first thing, um, I really liked that specific uh, comment you made in response to Ella about you know, do we want to educate people to be stupid or ignorant? I just thought that was really uh, funny. Um, but also like a really great uh, point to make. Um, but my question specifically was on the concept of disposability. Um, you mentioned it on page 67, I think, of uh, Pedagogy of Resistance. Um, and so my comment or my question kind of is about, it, it seems to me like in every aspect of life, um, there is someone who has to suffer for uh, uh, suffer for the rest of us to live a life of comfort and luxury. Um, so that being said, what makes it okay for them to suffer for our convenience? And what makes somebody disposable enough that they have to live in a harsh reality while we can live without knowing that same reality? Um, I, I, yeah, I think there are two issues. I mean, I, mean, I, I think the first thing is that when, if, if you have an economic system that basically says that inequality is okay, and it's part of what it means to basically function in a particular social order, what you tend to do is you tend to normalize inequality. And you normalize it by saying there's no alternative. That hierarchies of, of this sort where some people suffer and some people don't is basically a normal part of everyday life. That's a lie. That's just a political lie. That's a lie that basically normalizes capitalism in its most extreme forms. And I think that has, that has to be exposed. Uh, the second thing is that uh, ties in with that logic of disposability is the notion that is, is, the, the, is how you normalize it and how you specifically normalize it. And what, you often do, what they often do is they say that whatever position you occupy in society is basically due to your own, your own sense of character. You know, you individualize the problem, right? You say all matters of social responsibility, all matters of agency are basically individual problems. And that, you know, you, you, you cut off uh, the conditions under which people live from any larger systemic considerations like inequality, uh, you know, uh, a whole range of issues, and, and, and you blame them. So it, when responsibility is individualized like that, people can't translate private issues into larger systemic considerations. And that's part of the logic of disposability. Couple that with an, a, a, a form of a, a rebranded fascist politics. And what you get is, is you get particular groups now being targeted in this sense. Blacks, browns, young people who are poor, um, uh, undocumented immigrants. It, it, to put it even more generally, look, you have a system globally that has failed economically. We saw it with the crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, and we see it now in that neoliberal capitalism no longer attempts to defend itself by saying, hey, look, you know, everybody will have jobs, everybody will climb the social ladder, meritocracy is alive and well, another normalizing ideology. So don't worry, well, you know, this is what it will do. Well, it didn't do that. You have massive inequality. You have corrupt politics. You have a move towards uh, fascism and authoritarianism. So it no longer can defend itself by making the claim that it's the best of all systems. So now what does it do? It blames blacks. It blames immigrants. It blames brown people. It blames young people because it's, a po it's part of the politics of diversion and disappearance. And so it, it, it seems to me the notion that somehow this market 
this neoliberal capitalism that we face is 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 you know is normal, <laughs> you know, and that we have to live with this, and that for those of us who have grown up on the margins, that's where we belong because we don't try hard enough. Just nonsense. It's ideological nonsense. But more than that, it's a form of terrorism. It's a form of pedagogical terrorism because it shuts down the creative possibilities, the capacities that people would ordinarily have in a society not marked by massive inequality and not governed under the assumption that the market should determine all aspects of uh, social life. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Ms. Uh, JV, and I think you're up next. Howdy, duty. I'm JV on Chen, as you can see by my nameplate. And so, my question, let's start with some context. So my question is referencing the part of chapter four where you talk about politics as a site of racialized violence. And in my mind, that looks like, say for example, the recent anti-CRT bills that passed in several states across the country that essentially just limited discussions of racism in classrooms. And for me, what that, and for me, that also opened up the door for other types of bills in that same vein, such as the don't say gay bills that are passing, the numerous anti-trans bills that are passing right now. And it also spills over into more direct forms of physical harm. For clarity, I think the don't say gay slash what have you bills are also very physical forms of harm, but besides the point. Um, such as Oklahoma and Iowa passing bills that exoner or exonerate, is that the word? Yeah, exonerate people who drive through protest crowds, for example, right? right? So, Essentially, the point I'm making here is that in my mind, these racialized discourses are the site by which the political is seated to the right. And if that's true, then in my mind, the political has already been seated to the right, i.e. we exist under a political sphere where the only real ideology that exists are right wing ideologies. Therefore, my question to you is, what does critical advocacy look like in a world where a good faith seat at the marketplace of ideas, as they say, is not guaranteed? where the political has already been seated to the right. Well, I, I think the claim that the that that politics, that the frontier of politics has basically been seated to the right doesn't necessarily mean that all resistance is dead. It just necessarily means that you have to connect the dots and fight harder. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the arguments that need to be made here, and I think you've done it in a way in which you begin to articulate the different sites in which this racialized, this racist discourse, not racialized, this racist discourse is at work. You know, whether we're talking about uh, voter suppression laws or we're talking about, you know, the banning of books or we're talking about the attack on critical race theory, or we're talking about the fact that teachers have to take uh, uh, sign loyalty oaths uh, in some states now. I mean, this is all part of an attack on the public good, right? This is all part of an attack on democracy. It's all part of an, att of an attack basically on critical, on critical thinking and critical pedagogy. It's an attack on, on the possibility that people may be able to be in institutions in which they can learn how to hold power accountable. So what that makes clear is that you're in a phase in which politics has now seized upon the cultural as a realm to shape consciousness in ways unlike we have ever seen before, particularly given the power of the social media. All of a sudden, we're not talking about domination simply in terms of inst economic institutions. We're talking about domination in terms of a, a, a rebranding, a reforming, a reshaping of mass consciousness that becomes individualized, that becomes the object of the, as, as uh, Mizbah has said, the logic of disposability, that becomes uh, uh, central to the logic of white supremacy. And so it, it, it seems to me that there are two issues here. One is it no longer hides in the shadows. It's always been there, as you know, right? I mean, the legacy of Jim Crow begins, uh, you know, <laughs> begins with slavery. But all of a sudden, what we have now is a discourse that doesn't hide that, that form of oppression or, or glance over it with silly terms like colorblindness. Now what we have is a white supremacist party in the United States that basically takes as a badge of honor its own racism and now links that to policies that often people don't connect. If you, you have to be able to connect the attack on critical race theory with basically the attack on Southern immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants. It's all part of the same logic. You know, it's, it's part of a logic that says that 
the most basic principles of white supremacy are that the public sphere and the notion of citizenship and the notion of the social and the notion of social agency can only be granted to white people, particularly to white Christians. And so it, it, it seems to me that the, the targets are very visible. And so that offers up an enormous opportunity to be able to at least provide people with a larger discourse in which they can make choices. What do you wanna do? Do you wanna be a fascist? Or do you want to fight for democracy in whatever way you want? But you can't have a democracy by basically attacking in, in, with, through various forms of racism, a whole range of institutions and claim that somehow this is good for everybody. It's not good for everybody. It's good for people who hold power. And they happen to be white supremacists at the moment, uh, with, the, with the exception of the Democratic Party, which is so lost that it doesn't know wh where it belongs. You know, it, it, you know, it wants to stay on the side of Goldman Sachs and the bankers, uh, and it's, it may find racism repulsive, but it has no third way because it really still believes in the market and has no understanding of how economic power drives politics. Thanks. Uh, Sophia, you're up. Okay. Hi. Uh, so let me read my comment here. Um, under the fascist culture that is brewing around us, we have monetized everything, including education. Um, I feel like we are considered nothing more than consumers, and the system abuses and weaponizes that. Um, you mentioned the pandemic in your book, which stood out to me. Uh, the idea that we are constantly living in fear is brought to the surface, and it is clear what is prioritized in our society. Um, I feel like the system is designed to be void of criticism under this false notion of democracy. And there's no focus on stimulating ideas. So my question for you is, how do we create these constructive resolutions and where do we begin to tackle these issues? It's, it's, it's a terrific question, Sophie. And I, and I think, you know, you, we, your generation lives in an image-based culture. You know, we've, we've moved away from a print culture. We've, we've moved into the, into the logic and the politics of the spectacle. And it seems to me that that spectacle, while it's those sites that produce the spectacle, uh, call them what you may. C. Wright Mills called them the, the cultural apparatuses. Uh, Jonathan Kerry calls them the, you know, the, 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 a form of internet terrorism. But the fact of the matter is, young people have to move away from simply being cultural critics to being cultural producers. And it seems in doing that, they have to find ways to basically seize culture as in, in the spheres in which it's produced, in ways in which they can consistently produce alternative ways of sort of looking at the world and educating both young people and others. That's one issue. Uh, and that's a very important issue because it says, as, as the book says repeatedly, and you, whether you agree with it or not, that education is absolutely central to politics. It's become the central element of politics. The pedagogical is utterly political, and the pedagogical now does not take place simply in schools. It takes place across a, a wide, wide range of sites that young people have to inhabit in some way and begin to seize and to produce an alternative language. Secondly, it seems to me you have to be, there, there has to be a way in which this, this language of resistance translates into the joining of social movements. You can't do this alone. You know, any notion of resistance, if it becomes privatized or individualized, is going to fail. And it has to not only, not only do people have to join up with other social movements, and these social movements have to join up with each other, but it seems to me they, they have to get beyond simply matters of demonstrations. You've got to talk about long-term institutions and what it means and what they might look like. Uh, free schools, uh, you know, uh, health care that uh, even at local levels that basically is not organized around profit, but is organized around sharing and compassion. And we see it in places, different forms of worker organization, which we've seen in Latin America, and increasingly you see in some parts of the United States, we have to be able to think about what the democratic, what democratic models look like that are antithetical to the models that are operative in capitalism and the capitalism that basically are hierarchical, exploitive, and concentrate wealth in relatively few hands. Great. Thank uh, you. Aurora, you're up. Hello. <laughs> so then based off of that question in connection with Sophia's, like, since it's been outlined, do you actually think like it is possible for us to move in this more like progressive way? Like, do you feel like positive or like hopeful about the future of our new generation and like creating agency and this progressivism? Do you feel positive about it or 
do you actually like have a more pessimistic view of I wouldn't be on the left if I didn't feel positive. <laughs> I, I don't I, I don't think for one minute minute that if you don't have a sense of hope, you could possibly call yourself a progressive of any stripe. But but I but I think Aurora, there's another question here beneath that that wonderful question. And and that is look, domination, power is never simply about domination. Never. Even in the camps in the 1930s, believe it or not, people resisted. And, and I think the spaces of resistance tend to move up and down and fluctuate depending upon the historical circumstances we find ourselves. And I'll give you one example of where I think hope comes into play and why I think the language of critique always has to be followed by, uh, associated with the language of possibility. We have workers' strikes now taking place all over the country. All over the country, Amazon people are striking and they're winning uh, against Be Bezos, no less. Teachers now have had it. They've had it. You know, some of them have two and three jobs. You know, they're, they're slave wages. They no longer have control over the conditions of their labor and they're walking out. Students are walking out. The Black Lives Matter movement, among many, not, not just one. I mean, that's often mentioned to the expense of a whole range of, of other movements being organized by brown, white, and black and black students. Um, so it's, it seems to me that the levels of resistance are actually multiplying. And I think one of the reasons that you see uh, an enormously fascist turn based on conspiracies and lies and stupidity and ignorance, I think it's a measure of the fear that ruling classes have in light of the resistance that they see. Certainly what we see going on in Florida is in part a response to the, to the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, they're demonized. Every time one of these morons says something, you know, that becomes a reference, which suggests something about the depths of their fear, which suggests something about the power of collective resistance, which suggests, suggests something about how there are cracks in the system. And those cracks will open up. Uh, no, I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, pessimism of, of the intelligence, intelligence and optimism of the will. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it works. I think you always have to be optimistic because you can never stop fighting. I remember once I was involved in a uh, demonstration with Howard Zinn in the 1970s. Howard Zinn was a very famous historian, now dead. Uh, and I looked around and we were, we, we, we were striking against the administration at BU. And I said, God, there aren't many people here. He went nuts. He said, so what? <laughs> you know, there are 40 people here. That's okay. That's a beginning. You know, everything is a beginning. Nothing is an end. And, and it, it, it seems to me that, uh, you, you know, when you struggle, while struggles offer no guarantees, the thing that frightens me about your question in terms of what's implicit is in it is that when you stop talking about hope, you not only tend to become cynical, you become complicit because you look away. Mm -hmm. And I think this business of not being a moral agent, not being a moral witness, giving up your sense of social agency, not just individual agency, your sense of social agency means they have won. That's a victory for them. So I don't care how bad it looks. It seems to me that resistance is both a beacon of possibility and a way to recover one's own sense of agency and the possibility of collective resistance. Thank you. Henry, do you have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, great, wonderful. Um, Joanna? I, I, I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere? Okay. <laughs> um, Joanna, you, uh, I think uh, I, I might have uh, missed you. And uh, your, your question about teachers ties right into what Henry was just talking about. Hi, um, thank you for being here. But my question was, how can teachers in the 17 states that have passed legislation um, restricting um, talking about racism or sexism and gender in the classroom, um, how can those teachers still advocate for students um, without losing their job? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 Joanna, the first thing, as dreadful as this sounds, has to be said. And that is, if you really believe in changing the social order in some fundamental way, there are always risks. 
And, and I understand that for some people, some the risks are more complex than others. And I completely understand that, which means that the level of involvement in terms of any kind of resistance may, be, may, may have to change for different people. I get it. But you're going to have to take a risk. They have to take a risk. And I, and, I, and I think that the stakes are so high now against teachers, so high, that I think, first of all, they can't do it alone. They have to mobilize. And they have to have a vision of what schools should be, as opposed to simply resisting what they're becoming. And I think that vision has to be used to educate people outside of schools to, who don't have kids in the schools, for instance, to be able to say, hey, look, we give up schooling and we give up education to the right and we give up a democracy. It's as simple as that. I mean, you know, if, if you don't have educated citizens, you don't inform uh, an informed public, you don't have a democracy. You can't have a democracy if people are stupid. You can't have a democracy if people are ignorant. You know, you can't talk about your, your children uh, uh, making learning how to govern rather be governed if they're if they don't know history. You can't hate and fear are not the ingredients that should organize a curriculum. And I and so I think that at one level there's division. The at another level there's the critique. And I think the critique has to be this is not about parental rights. This is about privatizing schools. This is about basically shutting down critical thought. This is about the end of critical pedagogy. This is about turning students into, into turning education into training. And I, I don't think that language uh, across the spectrum in the United States has really emerged yet. I think the emphasis on critical race theory is misguided, to be honest, because I don't think this is just an attack on critical race theory. I think this is an attack on critical thought itself. I think this is an attack on the very foundations of education not just critical race theory. Critical race theory is just, they just pull that out because it sounds good and it appeals to sort of the underlying racist impulses that so many people have in the United States. But I think the real attack here is that schools should give up their critical function. And I think teachers have to talk about that, but they also have to talk about defending, not only the school as a democratic public sphere, but you have to defend the conditions of their own labor. You know, you can't have any anybody walk into a school and say, you should be teaching this. And my preference, it should be imposed on everybody. That's bullshit, really. It's not about education. That's about indoctrination. That's about propaganda. That's about molding the school in your own interest and losing sight of the larger social interest. So it seems to me they need a language. They need, to, they need a vision. They need a, a, a notion of critique. And they need to organize across the United States. And they did this for a while, but they also need to do it with students. This is not just about teachers. This is also about young people. It's about your generation, your children, eventually. I mean, the stakes are really high here. And I think that's what they've got to focus on, the nobility of the stakes and what it means for the children and what it means for the future. Great. I think we're up to Sua. Hi, um, it's such an honor to be here. <laughs> and so um, my question too is more personal. So I see through um, your new book that there are you know, mentions of the new policies that have changed and you know, the current trends, but um, in the midst of that, you still have, uh, you mentioned about pedagogy of hope and you mentioned about the potential. And then throughout this meeting too, that you had mentioned about having hope as a progressive person. So um, with all, in light of all of that, my question to you is how do you keep, uh, you know, fighting, fighting the fight? Um, because I feel like a lot of us are maybe the pedagogy of resistance is there, but about like pedagogy of resilience, because I feel like there's so many challenges ahead. But how do you keep, you know, fighting the fight? So, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you. Um, so a long time ago, long before you were born, I was at Boston University and I attended a lecture with Agnes Heller. She was you you, you probably don't know what this means, but she was the secretary for. Uh, for George, George Lukács, one of the most famous Marxists of all times. And I, you know, I was probably your age and I walked up to her and I said, how do you do this? You know, like, tell me, you know, <laughs> give me, give me an instant answer. I need, I need an answer, you know? And she turned to me in this gravelly voice 
She said, you plant seeds. You plant seeds. And you know, it, it really, it, in some ways it changed my life because I, I think we often think about change in the most apocalyptic transformative ways and it seems overwhelming, overwhelming. You know, we'll storm the White House tomorrow and everything will be okay. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and, I, and I think that we do what we do with the gifts that we have in ways that make a difference and don't allow our own conscience, consciences to collapse. The real question you're asking is, how do you not allow, I think, how do you not allow the, our conscience to collapse and at the same time do something about it? And I think we do it individually with the, with the, with the professions we choose. We do it in terms of how we interact with people and we do it in terms of the social movements that we often interact with. But your generation faces something that my generation didn't. And that is my generation had a sense of the collective and the social. There was a, a war going on in Vietnam. There were mass mobilizations. There was a larger sort of goal to sort of address what the, the political meant and what our role was in engaging the political. Your generation has been so individualized, so privatized. Your, your generation has been told that responsibility is meaningless except for individuals. And that's just simply uh, a logic that says something about your individual character. So matters of social responsibility, matters of larger movements, matters of a larger politics tend to disappear. And it's a way in which we get, we get depoliticized. The logic of depoliticization in your generation is much, much greater than it was in mine, I think. And I may be terribly wrong on that, but I think that's the case. And so your question is, you know, how do you keep going? I think, I think one is, again, you have to keep going because you, if you give up, you become you become part of something that's horrible. I think you know. Secondly, there's a lot of joy in organizing. There's a lot of joy in working with other people and trying to find a way to basically learn how to be written back into the script of democracy. You know, you you can't allow yourself to be written out of that script. S thirdly, it's it seems to me we have to reclaim a notion of the social. The social has died in the United States. It's, 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 it's almost pathologized in, in, in some way. I mean, it, it sort of functions as this, suggests that whenever it's there, whether it's social goods, public schools, social parks, public goods, I mean, public institutions, social provisions, the welfare state, it's all been seen as something that doesn't matter anymore, placing a much greater burden on individuals to do something about the situations in which they find themselves. And I think it's in that sense of the collective that we have to nurture a, a, a sense of resistance and a sense of possibility that keeps us going. Thank you. Uh, Henry, I think uh, we, we have a, just a few more, more minutes left in our time, but um, uh, I, don't, I think we're out of uh, the planned questions. If you have any questions you'd like to ask the students, um, yeah, I, I, I guess the, 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 the question that I think is, is, is crucial is, you know, often politics is associated with youth. And, you know, I, I guess the question is, what do you see in your generation that presents both a challenge and a sense of possibility? I mean, how do you define yourself as young people living in a time when democracy is under siege? Uh, tyranny seems to be reproducing itself in ways that are unreal. And yet at the same time, your generation is one of the most progressive generations the United States has seen in years. I mean, this is, there's a contradiction here, right? There's a contradiction between the fact that your generation is multicultural. You're not a, it's not a racist generation per se. Uh, you, you, you believe in all the things that people on the left tend to believe in from women's reproductive rights to you know, equality, uh, economic equality. And I, and I guess, how do you nurture that collective progressivism in a way that would feed your own sense of possibility and push your imaginations further to get beyond simply att attempting to do this alone? That's a complex question, but 
I was hoping maybe somebody could pick out a pot of that, you know? Oh, the yeah, hand's going right, up. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so for me, that is like an insanely loaded question. But for me, I don't know. I feel like one of this generation's greatest strengths is our like connectivity through the internet, which is ironic given how much like people in this room have said like the internet has like adverse negative effects, right? But I don't know, for me, it's like once I got introduced through to like stuff like critical theory, uh, I don't know, just grassroots organizations in general through things like high school debate or whatever. Ever since then, it's just blossomed into this, into this like huge thing where like now my online social media presence involves a lot of critical theory and grassroots organization. I find content of it on TikTok. I find organizations that I've never even heard of and never knew of and never imagined existed on Twitter sometimes, right? And like the vast distance, the, that vast like, uh, I can't think of the word, but that vast like expulsion of knowledge, it just has to be doing something, I feel, right? Yeah, it can be misappropriated. Yeah, it can't always be trusted because again, all these social media corporations are owned by massive corporations. But I feel like if we were able to just more collectively harness the potential, the like overwhelming potential for organization and critical thought that the internet can provide us, we'd be in an even better state as a generation than we are already. How we do that, somebody more knowledgeable than me will have to figure that out for the moment. But th there has to be a way. I believe that there's a way. I mean, that, that's a question that's not really about the technologies. It's about its relationship to relations of power. And it seems to me, as long as that, I, at least for me, and for people like, you know, of course, Jonathan Crary, who claims the internet should be abolished. I mean, uh, you know, the, the real fundamental question here is not to say that there's nothing there that can't be used, obviously it can be, although there's an enormous amount of research saying that it really doesn't do as much as you think it does, or to say the least. Uh, but this is really an argument about capitalism, right? And this is really an argument about who controls it. It's really an argument about not where there are elements of resistance that could be seized and used, um, but it's about questions of equity. It's about questions of control. I mean, it's about you know the power of the of the media now being used in the interest of relatively few people. I mean, I mean, this guy who just bought the buying Twitter. Oh my God! Uh, you, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I I get what you're saying. I, I I have two reservations about this. One is, I don't trust uh, the notion. I don't confuse access to knowledge with a real notion of embodied community and struggle. I think they're very different things, and I and I think that often the way in which the internet functions to basically privatize and isolate seems to me to be far more dangerous in some ways than it is according to the logic of bringing people together. Access to information is not the same as organizing in embodied ways in which people literally come together and work uh, to display and be part of social movements that make a difference. Now, do I still think it's important to have access to? Yeah, but I think there's a larger framework that has to be understood before we start celebrating it in ways that vanish or disappear. Uh, it really, it's most erroneous and really dreadful uh, consequences in a, in a neoliberal society. Annabelle? Hi, um, just kind of tying along with that, I think, uh... I think, you know, the biggest thing for me is like, what do we have to lose at this point? <laughs> like, you know, like I, throughout taking this course throughout the semester, like looking at all these different readings, I am noticing all these things in my life that I just never did before. And I think, you know, we talk about what do we do as teachers, you know, potentially living in these states with these kind of bills. And it's like, what do we what do we have to lose because the alternative to not doing anything is sitting back and watching it happen and I personally can't do that <laughs> because it's just I mean we all we all all of our you know basic human rights essentially are being attacked and we can't we can't just sit idly by so I mean there's two things that I that personally I really like and, and one is if the if, if fascism begins with language so does a sense of empowerment and possibility. And then the question becomes, you know, how does this not become merely discursive? I mean, how do you articulate language to action and, and power, right? And 
what you've said is you really, in some ways, have no choice, you know, unless you want to sit back and become complicitous with that. And I, and I, I love the idea of all of a sudden being exposed to a language that not only reorganizes and challenges the common sense assumptions that generally limit our sense of agency, but actually open it up. You know, and, and, and not only open it up in ways of seeing the world very differently, but open up in a very different way, the possibility of how to change it. Henry, thank you so much. Oh, um, we're we're over time here. Um, Ugo, Ugo has his hand up. I don't know if we want to, if people are willing to go a little bit longer, or if we should uh, follow the schedule. Go, do, let him do it. Let him ask the question. I'll answer it quickly. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I promise I won't take up too much of your time, Professor. Um, no, I just wanted to respond to your um, to your question. I think that um, you know, for me in my case, uh, I've always been surrounded by people who have been like you know very progressive minded, um, and then kind of just tying into like what the Annabelle was saying. You know, uh, as a person of color, I think that being complacent is almost like a crime in this case. You know, so so I think that there's that you know that conscious. Um, part of it, <clears throat> but also, I mean, I, you know, my parents come from places, you know, where, where, you know, um, the authoritarian governments, dictatorships and stuff like that, you know, so, so we're, you know, in their times, if they ever wanted to protest something, you know, something like we're, like we're discussing here in, uh, in class, you know, they would have disappeared. They could have, you know, turned out in a ditch somewhere with bullets, you know, in their heads. And that's not the case in this country. You know, at least not 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 for now. You know, um, so I think that that's one of the biggest reasons in terms of why you know I continue to embrace like you know um, progressive ideologies because I believe in it. Um, and um, also, you know, it's just just how I was socialized. It's how I was, it's how I was raised. So it's something that you know I just kind of like openly embrace. But I also think that you know um, continuing to participate in this struggle is 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 key. And you know, I think that the struggle never really ends. I think you know people you know, pass, pass a baton to you in terms, you know, in terms of um, like this generational shift. Um, but yeah, it's like never ending, but at the same time, it's, I mean, you know, I, I always kind of see it as the fight worth fighting. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's fabulous. <laughs> okay, Ken, yeah. All right, Henry. Henry, thank you again. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank, I wanna thank everyone uh, who participated in the conversation with Henry. Uh, this has been great. And we're really excited about the new book and uh, very enthusiastic. Congratulations on it. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I really do. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.